The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 6, Side 2. The name syphilis was first applied to the disease by Girolamo Fracastoro, one of the most varied and yet best integrated characters of the Renaissance. He had a good start. He was born at Verona in 1483 of a patrician family that had already produced outstanding physicians. At Padua he studied almost everything. He had Copernicus as a fellow student, and Pomponazzi and Achillini to teach him philosophy and anatomy. At twenty-four he was himself professor of logic. Soon he retired to devote himself to scientific, above all medical, research, tempered with the fond study of classic literature. This association of science and letters produced a rounded personality and a remarkable poem, written in Latin on the model of Virgil's Georgics, and entitled Syphilis, Sive de Morbo Gallico, 1521. Italian since Lucretius have excelled in writing poetical didactic poetry, but who would have supposed that the undulant spirochete would lend itself to fluent verse? Syphilis in ancient mythology was a shepherd who decided to worship not the gods whom he could not see, but the king, the only visible lord of his flock. Whereupon angry Apollo infected the air with noxious vapors, from which Syphilis contracted a disease fouled with ulcerous eruptions over his body. This is essentially the story of Job. Fracastoro proposed to trace the first appearance, epidemic spread, causes, and therapy of a fierce and rare sickness never before seen for centuries past, which ravished all of Europe and the flourishing cities of Asia and Libya, and invaded Italy in that unfortunate war whence from the Gauls it has its name. He doubted that the ailment had come from America, for it appeared almost simultaneously in many European countries far apart. The infection did not manifest itself at once, but remained latent for a certain time, sometimes for a month, even for four months. In the majority of cases, small ulcers began to appear on the sexual organs. Next, the skin broke out with encrusted pustules. Then these ulcerated pustules ate away the skin and infected even the bones. In some cases, the lips or nose or eyes were eaten away, or in others, the whole of the sexual organs. The poem goes on to discuss treatment by mercury or by guayac, a holy wood used by the American Indians. In a later work, De Contagione, Fracastoro dealt in prose with various contagious diseases, syphilis, typhus, tuberculosis, and the modes of contagion by which they could be spread. In 1545 he was called by Paul III to be head physician for the Council of Trent. Verona raised a noble monument to his memory, and Giovanni dal Cavino graved his likeness on a medallion which is one of the finest works of its kind. Before 1500 it was usual to class all contagious diseases together under the indiscriminate name of the plague. It was one measure of the progress of medicine that it now clearly distinguished and diagnosed the specific character of an epidemic, and was prepared to deal with so sudden and virulent an eruption as syphilis. Mere reliance on Hippocrates and Galen could never have sufficed in such a crisis. It was because the medical profession had learned the necessity of ever-fresh and detailed study of symptoms, causes, and cures, in an ever-widening and intercommunicated experience, that it could meet this unexpected test. And it was because of such high qualifications, devotion, and practical success that the better class of physicians was now recognized as belonging to the untitled aristocracy of Italy. Having completely secularized their profession, they made it more respected than the clergy. Several of them were not only the medical, but as well the political advisers and the frequent and favored companions of princes, prelates, and kings. Many of them were humanists, familiar with classical literature, collecting manuscripts and works of art. Often they were the close friends of great artists. Finally, many of them realized the Hippocratic ideal of adding philosophy to medicine. They passed with ease from one subject to another in their studies and their teaching, and they gave the professional philosophical fraternity a stimulus to subject Plato, Aristotle, and Aquinas, as they subjected Hippocrates, Galen, and Avicenna, to a fresh and fearless examination of reality. 4. Philosophy at first glance, the Italian Renaissance does not seem to offer a reasonable harvest of philosophy. Its product cannot compare with the heyday of French scholasticism, from Abelard to Aquinas, not to speak of the School of Athens. Its most famous name in philosophy, if we extend the time limit of the Renaissance, is Giordano Bruno, 
who lived possibly from 1548 to 1600, whose work lies beyond the period of our study in this volume. Pomponazzi remains, but who now does reverence to his poor heroic skeptical squeak? The humanists incubated a philosophical revolution by discovering and cautiously revealing the world of Greek philosophy. But, for the most part, and excepting Vala, they were too clever to lay their beliefs on the table. The university professors of philosophy were hobbled by the scholastic tradition. After spending seven or eight years struggling through that wilderness, they either abandoned it for other fields of study or drove another generation into it, glorifying the hurdles that had broken their wills and brought their intellects to a safe dead end. And who knows, but many of them felt a certain mental and economic security in confining themselves to recondite problems carefully and fruitlessly phrased in unintelligible terminology. In most philosophical faculties, scholasticism was still de rigueur, and already stiffening with the approach of death. The old medieval questions were laboriously reviewed in the old medieval forms of disputation and in the proud publications of the staff. Two elements of life entered to revive philosophy— the conflict between Platonists and Aristotelians, and the division of Aristotelians into Orthodox and Averroists. At Bologna and Padua, these conflicts became veritable duels, literally matters of life and death. The humanists were mostly Platonists, under the influence of Jamistus Pletho, Bessarion, Theodorus Gaza, and other Greeks. They drank deeply of the wine of the dialogues, and could hardly understand how anyone could bear the arid logic impotent organon and leaden golden mean of the cautious Aristotle. But these Platonists were resolved to remain Christians, and it was, so to speak, as their representative and delegate that Marsilio Ficino devoted half his life to reconciling the two systems of thought. For this purpose he studied widely, going so far afield as to Zoroaster and Confucius. When he reached Plotinus and himself translated the Enneads, he felt that he had found in mystic Neoplatonism the silken cord that would bind Plato to Christ, he tried to formulate this synthesis in his Theologia Platonica, a confused medley of orthodoxy, occultism, and Hellenism, and arrived hesitantly at a pantheistic conclusion. God is the soul of the world. This became the philosophy of Lorenzo and his circle, of the Platonic academies in Rome, Naples, and elsewhere. From Naples it reached Giordano Bruno. From Bruno it passed to Spinoza and thence to Hegel. It is still alive. But there was something to be said for Aristotle, especially if he could be misinterpreted. Was Aquinas right in understanding him to teach personal immortality? Or was Averroes right in reading De Anima as affirming the deathlessness of only the collective soul of mankind? The terrible Averroes, that ogre of an Arab, whom Italian art had long since pictured as prostrate under the feet of St. Thomas, was so active a competitor for the domination of the Aristotelians that both Bologna and Padua were hot with his heresy. It was at Padua that the Marsilius, who took its name, had lost his reverence for the Church. At Padua that Filippo Algeri da Nola, the precursor of Nola-born Bruno, had imbibed those frightful errors for which he was sorrowfully cast into a barrel of boiling pitch. Nicoletto Vernius, as professor of philosophy at Padua from 1471 to 1499, appears to have taught there the doctrine that only the world soul, not the individual soul, is immortal and his pupil Agostino Nifo propounded the same notion in a treatise De Intellectu et Daimonibus in 1492. Usually the skeptics sought to soothe the Inquisition by distinguishing, as Averroes had done, between two kinds of truth, religious and philosophical. A proposition, they urged, might be rejected in philosophy from the standpoint of reason, while still accepted on faith in the word of Scripture or the Church. Nifo professed the principle with reckless simplification— Loquendum est ut plures, sentiendum ut pauci. We must speak as the many do, we must think as the few. Nepho changed his mind or his speech as his hair changed and reconciled himself to orthodoxy. As professor of philosophy at Bologna, he drew lords, ladies, and multitudes to lectures dramatized with grimaces and antics, insulted with anecdotes and wit. He became socially the most successful opponent of Pomponazzi. Pietro Pomponazzi, the microscopic bombshell of Renaissance philosophy, was so diminutive that his familiars called him Pareto, Little Peter. But he had a large head, a vast brow, a hooked nose, small black penetrating eyes. Here was a man doomed to take life and thought with painful seriousness.
Born at Mantua in 1462 of patrician stock, he studied philosophy and medicine at Padua, took both degrees at twenty-five, and was soon himself a professor there. All the skeptical tradition of Padua descended to him and culminated in him. As his admirer of Anini was to put it, Pythagoras would have judged that the soul of Averroes had transmigrated into the body of Pomponazzi. Wisdom seems always a reincarnation or echo, since it remains the same through a thousand varieties and generations of error. Pomponazzi continued to teach at Padua from 1495 to 1509. Then the winds of war swept through the city and closed its historic university halls. In 1512 we find him established at the University of Bologna. There he remained to the end of his days, marrying thrice, always lecturing on Aristotle, and modestly likening his relation to his master to that of an insect exploring an elephant. He thought it safer to offer his ideas not as his own, but as implied or explicit in Aristotle, interpreted by Alexander of Aphrodisias. His procedure seems at times too humble, apparently subservient to a dead authority. But since the Church, following Aquinas, claimed her doctrine to be that of Aristotle, Pomponazzi may have felt that any demonstration of a heresy as truly Aristotelian would be one way, short of the stake, of teasing the orthodox tale. The Fifth Council of the Lateran, under the presidency of Leo X in 1513, condemned all who should assert that the soul is one and indivisible in all men, and that the individual soul is mortal. Three years later, Pomponazzi published his major work, De Immortalitate Animae, in which he sought to show that the condemned view was precisely that of Aristotle. Mind, said Pietro's Aristotle, is at every step dependent upon matter. The most abstract knowledge is ultimately derived from sensation. Only through the body can mind act upon the world. Consequently, a disembodied soul, surviving the mortal frame, would be a functionless and helpless wraith. As Christians and faithful sons of the Church, Pomponazzi concluded, we are warranted in believing in the immortality of the individual soul. As philosophers, we are not. It seems never to have occurred to Pomponazzi that his argument had no validity against Catholicism, which taught the resurrection of the body as well as of the soul. Perhaps he did not take this doctrine seriously, and had no thought that his readers would. No one, so far as we know, urged it against him. The book ran into a storm. The Franciscan friars persuaded the doge of Venice to order all procurable copies to be publicly burned, which was done. Protests were made to the papal court, but Bembo and Bibiena were then high in Leo's councils, and advised him that the conclusions of the book were perfectly orthodox. The conclusions were. Leo was not fooled. He knew quite well this little trick of the two truths, but he contented himself with ordering Pomponazzi to write a decent word of submission. Pietro complied in Apologiae Libri Tres in 1518, reasserting that as a Christian he accepted all the teaching of the Church. About the same time, Leo commissioned Agostino Nifo to compose an answer to Pomponazzi's book. As Agostino loved controversy, he executed this assignment with pleasure and skill. It is remarkable, and perhaps illustrates a continuing antipathy between the universities and the clergy, that while Pomponazzi's head hung, so to speak, in this inquisitorial balance, three universities competed for his services. Hearing that Pisa was seeking to lure him to her halls, the magistrates of Bologna, formerly subject to the Pope but deaf to the Franciscan Fuhrer, confirmed Pomponazzi's professorial tenure for eight years further and raised his annual salary to 1,600 ducats, or about $20,000. In two minor books, which he did not publish in his lifetime, Pomponazzi continued his skeptical campaign. In De Incantatione, he reduced to natural causes many supposedly supernatural phenomena. A physician had written to him about cures allegedly due to incantations or charms. Pietro bade him doubt. It would be ridiculous and absurd, he wrote, to despise what is visible and natural in order to have recourse to an invisible cause, the reality of which is not guaranteed to us by any solid probability. As a Christian, he accepts angels and spirits. As a philosopher, he rejects them. All causes under God are natural. Reflecting his medical training, he laughs at the widespread belief in occult sources of cure. If spirits could cure the ills of the flesh, they would have to be material, or use material means to affect a material body. And he ironically pictures the healing spirits as rushing about with their paraphernalia of plasters, ointments, and pills.
However, he admits certain curative powers in some plants and stones. He will accept the miracles of the Bible, but suspects that they were natural operations. The universe is governed by uniform and invariable laws. Miracles are unusual manifestations of natural forces whose powers and methods are only partly known to us. And what the people cannot understand they ascribe to spirits or to God. Without contradicting this view of natural causation, Pomponazzi accepts much of astrology. Not only are the lives of men subject to the action of the heavenly bodies, but all human institutions, he thinks, even including religions, rise and flourish and decay according to celestial influences. This is true also of Christianity. At the present moment, says Pomponazzi, there are signs that Christianity is dying. He adds that as a Christian, he rejects all this as nonsense. His final book, De Fato, seems more orthodox, for it is a defense of free will. He admits its incompatibility with divine foreknowledge and omniscience, but stands on his consciousness of free activity and on the necessity of assuming some freedom of choice if there is to be any moral responsibility in man. In his treatise on immortality, he had faced the question whether a moral code could succeed without supernatural punishments and rewards. He held, with stoic pride, that the sufficient reward of virtue is virtue itself, not any post-mortem paradise. But he confessed that most men can be induced to decency only by supernatural hopes and fears. Hence, he explained, great legislators have taught the belief in a future state as an economical substitute for ubiquitous police. And like Plato, he justifies the inculcation of fables and myths if these can help to control the natural wickedness of men. Therefore they have posited, for the virtuous, eternal reward in another life, but for the sinful, eternal punishments, which frighten them very greatly. And the greater part of men, if they do good, do it more from fear of eternal punishment than hope of eternal good, since the punishments are more known to us than those eternal goods. And since this last device can benefit all men, of whatever class they are, the legislator, seeing the proneness of men to evil and intending the common good, has decreed that the soul is immortal, not caring for truth but only for righteousness, so that he may bring men to virtue. Most men, he thinks, are so simple mentally and so brutish morally that they must be treated as children or invalids. It is not wise to teach them the doctrines of philosophy. These things, he says of his own speculations, are not to be communicated to common people, for they are incapable of receiving these secrets. We must beware even of holding discourse concerning them with ignorant priests. He divides mankind into philosophers and religious persons, and innocently believes that philosophers alone are the gods of the earth, and differ as much from all other men, of whatever rank and condition, as genuine men differ from those painted on canvas. In humbler moments he realized the narrow limits of human reason and the honorable futility of metaphysics. He pictured himself in his later years as worn and haggard with the thought about it, and likened the philosopher to Prometheus, who, because he wished to steal fire from heaven, that is, snatch at divine knowledge, was condemned to be bound to a rock and to have his heart gnawed at by a vulture endlessly. The thinker who inquires into the divine mysteries is like Proteus. The Inquisition persecutes him as a heretic. The multitude mocks him as a fool. The controversies in which he engaged wore him down and helped to ruin his health. He suffered from one illness after another until finally he determined to die. He chose a hard form of suicide. He starved himself to death. Resisting every argument and every threat and triumphing even over force, he refused either to eat or to speak. After seven days of this regimen, he felt that he had won his battle for the right to die and might now safely speak. I depart gladly, he said. Someone asked him, Where are you going? Where all mortals go, he answered. His friends made a final effort to persuade him to eat, but he preferred to die in 1525. Cardinal Gonzaga, who had been his pupil, had the remains transported to Mantua and buried there, and with typical Renaissance tolerance, raised a statue to his memory. Pomponazzi had put into philosophic form a skepticism that had for two centuries been attacking the foundations of Christian belief. The failure of the Crusades the influx of Moslem ideas through crusades, trade, and Arab philosophy, the removal of the papacy to Avignon and its ridiculous division in the schism, the revelation of a pagan Greco-Roman world full of wise men and great art and yet without the Bible or the Church, the spread of education and its increasing escape from ecclesiastical control, 
the immorality and worldliness of the clergy, even of popes, suggesting their private disbelief in the publicly professed creed, their use of the idea of purgatory to raise funds for their purposes, the reaction of the rising mercantile and moneyed classes against ecclesiastical domination, the transformation of the church from a religious organization into a secular political power. All these factors, and many more, combined to make the Italian middle and upper classes in the late 15th and early 16th century the most skeptical of European peoples. It is clear from the poetry of Politian and Pulci and the philosophy of Ficino that the circle of Lorenzo had no actual belief in another life. And the sentiment of Ferrara appears in the fun that Ariosto makes of the inferno that to Dante had seemed so frightfully real. Almost half the literature of the Renaissance is anti-clerical. Many of the condottieri were open atheists. The cortigiani, or courtiers, were far less religious than the cortigiani, or courtesans, and a polite skepticism was the mark and requisite of a gentleman. Petrarch lamented the fact that in the minds of many scholars it was a sign of ignorance to prefer the Christian religion to pagan philosophy. In Venice in 1530 it was found that most of the upper ranks neglected their Easter duty, that is, they did not go to confession and communion even once a year. Luther claimed to have found a saying current among the educated classes in Italy on going to Mass. Come, let us conform to the popular error. As to the universities, a curious incident reveals the temper of professors and students. Shortly after Pomponazzi's death, his pupil, Simone Porzio, invited to lecture at Pisa, chose as his text Aristotle's Meteorology. The audience did not like the subject. Several cried out impatiently, Quid de anima? What about the soul? Porzio had to set the meteorology aside and take up Aristotle's De anima. At once the audience was all attention. We do not know whether in that lecture Porzio expressed his belief that the human soul differs in no essential point from the soul of a lion or a plant. We do know that he so taught in his book De Mente Humana, on the human mind. And he seems to have escaped unharmed. Eugenio Taralba, indicted by the Spanish Inquisition in 1528, related that, as a youth, he had studied in Rome under three teachers, all of whom taught that the soul was mortal. Erasmus was astonished to find that at Rome the fundamentals of the Christian faith were topics of skeptical discussion among the cardinals. One ecclesiastic undertook to explain to him the absurdity of belief in a future life. Others smiled at Christ and the apostles. Many, he assures us, claimed to have heard papal functionaries blaspheming the Mass. The lower classes kept their faith, as we shall see. The thousands who heard Savonarola must have believed. The example of Vittoria Colonna shows that piety could survive education. But the soul of the great creed had been pierced with the arrows of doubt, and the splendor of the medieval myth had been tarnished by its accumulated gold. 5. Guicciardini The mind of Guicciardini summarizes the skeptical disillusionment of the times. It was one of the sharpest minds of the age, too cynical for our taste, too pessimistic for our hopes, but penetrating as a roving searchlight in the skies, and candid with the frankness of a writer who has wisely resolved on solely posthumous publication. Francesco Guicciardini had the initial advantage of aristocratic birth. From his childhood he heard educated conversation in good Italian and learned to accept life with the realism and grace of a man confident of his footing. His great-uncle was several times Gonfalonier of the Republic. His grandfather held in turn most of the principal offices in the government. His father knew Latin and Greek and filled several diplomatic posts. My godfather, wrote Francesco, was Messer Marsilio Ficino, the greatest platonic philosopher then in the world, which did not prevent the historian from becoming an Aristotelian. He studied civil law, and at the age of twenty-three was appointed professor of law at Florence. He traveled widely, even to noting the fantastic and bizarre inventions of Hieronymus Bosch in Flanders. At twenty-six, he married Maria Salviati because the Salviati, in addition to their wealth, surpassed other families in influence and power, and I had a great liking for these things. Nevertheless, he had a passion for excellence and the self-discipline to create works of literary art. His Storia Fiorentina, written at twenty-seven, is one of the most surprising products of an age when genius, swollen with its recovered heritage but loosened from tradition, flowed full and free in a dozen streams. The book limited itself to a short segment of Florentine history, 
from 1378 to 1509, but it treated that period with an accuracy of detail, a critical examination of sources, a penetrating analysis of causes, a maturity and impartiality of judgment, a command of vivid narrative in fine Italian that were not matched by the Storie Fiorentine that Machiavelli wrote eleven years later in the sixth decade of his life. In 1512, still a youth of thirty, Guicciardini was sent as ambassador to Ferdinand the Catholic. In quick succession, Leo X and Clement VII made him governor of Reggio Emilia, Modena, and Parma, then governor-general of all the Romagna, then lieutenant-general of all papal troops. In 1534 he returned to Florence and supported Alessandro de' Medici throughout that scoundrel's quinquennium of tyranny. In 1537 he was the chief agent in promoting the accession of Cosimo the Younger to be Duke of Florence. When his hopes of dominating Cosimo faded, Guicciardini retired to a rural villa to write in one year the ten volumes of his masterpiece, the Storia d'Italia. It is inferior to his earlier work in freshness and vigor of style. Guicciardini had meanwhile studied the humanists and slipped into formality and rhetoric. Even so, it is a stately style, presaging Gibbon's monumental prose. The subtitle, History of the Wars, limits the subject to matters military and political. At the same time, the field is widened to all Italy and to all Europe as related to Italy. This is the first history to view the European political system as a connected whole. Guicciardini writes of what for the most part he knew at first hand and toward the end of events in which he had played a part. He collected documents sedulously and is far more accurate and reliable than Machiavelli. If, like his more famous contemporary, he returns to the ancient custom of inventing speeches for the persons of his tale, he frankly states that they are true only in substance. Some he specifies as authentic, and all are used effectively to state both sides of a debate or to reveal the policies and diplomacy of the European states. Taken together, this massive history and the brilliant story of Fiorentina constitute Guicciardini as the greatest historian of the 16th century. As Napoleon was anxious to see Goethe, so Charles V at Bologna kept lords and generals waiting in an anteroom while he conversed at length with Guicciardini. I can create a hundred nobles in an hour, he said, but I cannot produce such an historian in twenty years. As a man of the world, he did not take too seriously the efforts of philosophers to diagnose the universe. He must have smiled at the excitement aroused by Pomponazzi, if he noticed it. Since the supernatural is beyond our ken, he considered it useless to war over rival philosophies. Doubtless all religions are based upon assumptions and myths, but these are forgivable if they help to maintain social order and moral discipline. For man, in Guicciardini's view, is by nature self-seeking, immoral, lawless. He has to be checked at every turn by custom, morals, law, or force— and religion is usually the least disagreeable means to these ends. But when a religion becomes so corrupt that it has a demoralizing rather than a moralizing influence, a society is in a bad way, for the religious supports of its moral code have been sapped. Guicciardini writes in his secret record, To no man it is more displeasing than to me to see the ambition, covetousness, and excesses of priests, not only because all wickedness is hateful in itself, but because such wickedness should find no place in men whose state of life implies a special relationship to God. My relations with several popes have made me desire their greatness at the expense of my own interest. Had it not been for this consideration, I would have loved Martin Luther as myself, not that I might set myself free from the laws imposed upon us by Christianity, but that I might see this swarm of scoundrels confined within due limits so that they might be forced to choose between a life without crime or a life without power. Nevertheless, his own morality was hardly superior to that of the priests. His personal code was to adjust himself to whatever powers were at the moment supreme. His general principles he kept for his books. There, too, he could be as cynical as Machiavelli. Sincerity pleases and wins praise. Dissimulation is censured and hated. The former, however, is more useful to others than to oneself. Therefore I should praise him whose usual mode of life was open and sincere, and who only used dissimulation in certain things of great importance. It then succeeds all the better, the more one has contrived to establish a reputation for sincerity. He saw through the shibboleths of the various political parties in Florence. Each group, though it shouted for liberty, wanted power. It seems clear to me that the desire of dominating one's fellows and asserting superiority is natural to man— 
so that there are few so in love with liberty that they would not seize a favorable opportunity of ruling and lording it. Look closely at the behavior of the indwellers of the selfsame city. Mark and examine their dissensions, and you shall find that the object is preponderance rather than freedom. Those, then, who are the foremost citizens do not strive after liberty, though that be in their mouths, but the increase of their own sway and preeminence is really in their hearts. Liberty is a cant term with them, and disguises their lust of superiority and power and honor. He despised the Soderini Merchant Republic, accustomed to defend its liberties with gold instead of arms, and he had no faith in the people or democracy. To speak of the people is to speak of madmen, for the people is a monster full of confusion and error, and its vain beliefs are as far from truth as is Spain from India. Experience shows that things very rarely come to pass according to the expectations of the multitude. The reason is that the effects commonly depend on the will of a few, and intentions and purposes are nearly always different from those of the many. Guicciardini was one of thousands in Renaissance Italy who had no faith whatever, who had lost the Christian idol, had learned the emptiness of politics, expected no utopia, dreamed no dreams, and who sat back helpless while a world of war and barbarism swept over Italy. Somber old men, emancipated in mind and broken in hope, who had discovered, too late, that when the myth dies, only force is free. 6. Machiavelli 1. The Diplomat One man remains, hard to classify. Diplomat, historian, dramatist, philosopher the most cynical thinker of his time, and yet a patriot fired with a noble ideal, a man who failed in everything that he undertook but left upon history a deeper mark than almost any other figure of the age. Niccolo Machiavelli was the son of a Florentine lawyer, a man of moderate means who held a minor post in the government and owned a small rural villa at San Casciano, ten miles out of the city. The boy received the ordinary literary education, learned to read Latin readily but no Greek, he took a fancy to Roman history, became enamored of Livy, and found for almost every political institution and event of his day an illuminating analogue in the history of Rome. He began but seems never to have completed the study of law. He cared little for the art of the Renaissance and expressed no interest in the discovery of America. Perhaps he felt that merely the theater of politics was now enlarged, while the plot and characters would remain unchanged. His one absorbing interest was politics, the technique of influence, the chess of power. In 1498, aged 29, he was appointed secretary to the Dieci della Guerra, a council of ten for war, and held that post for fourteen years. It was at first a modest function, compiling minutes and records, summarizing reports, writing letters. But he was in government. He could watch the politics of Europe from an inside observation point, he could try to forecast developments by applying his knowledge of history. His eager, nervous, ambitious spirit felt that only time was needed before he would be at the top, playing the heady game of state against the Duke of Milan, the Senate of Venice, the King of France, the King of Naples, the Pope, the Emperor. Soon he was sent on a mission to Caterina Sforza, Countess of Imola and Forli, in 1498. She proved too subtle for him, and he came back empty-handed, chastened. Two years later he was tried again, accompanied Francesco de la Casa as associate envoy to Louis XII of France. De la Casa fell ill, and Machiavelli had to head the mission. He learned French, followed the court from chateau to chateau, and transmitted to the seigneury such alert intelligence, such keen analyses, that on his return to Florence his friends acclaimed him now as a graduate diplomat. The turning point in his intellectual development was his mission, as aide to Bishop Soderini, to Caesar Borgia at Urbino in 1502. Called back to Florence for a personal report, he celebrated his rise in the world by taking a wife. In October, he was again dispatched to Caesar. He joined him at Imola and arrived at Senegalia just in time to note Borgia's happiness at having successfully ensnared and strangled or caged the men who had conspired against him. These were events that stirred all Italy. To Machiavelli, meeting the brilliant ogre in the flesh, they were lessons in philosophy. The man of ideas found himself face to face with the man of action, and did him homage. Envy burned in the young diplomat's soul as he realized the distance he had still to travel from analytical and theoretical thought to a magnificent crushing deed.
Here was a man six years younger than himself, who in two years had overthrown a dozen tyrants, given order to a dozen cities, and made himself the very meteor of his time. How weak words seemed before this youth who used them with such scornful scarcity. From that moment Caesar Borgia became the hero of Machiavelli's philosophy, as Bismarck would be of Nietzsche's. Here, in this embodied will to power, was a morality beyond good and evil, a model for supermen. Back in Florence in 1503, Machiavelli perceived that some members of the government suspected him of having been swept off his mental feet by the dashing Borgia. But his industrious scheming to advance the interests of his city regained for him the esteem of the Gonfalonier Soderini and the Council of Ten for War. In 1507, he saw the triumph of one of his basic ideas. No self-respecting state, he had long argued, could entrust its defense to mercenary troops. They could not be relied upon in a crisis, and they or their leader could almost always be bought by an enemy armed with sufficient gold. A national militia should be formed, said Machiavelli, composed of citizens, preferably of vigorous peasants used to hardship and the open air. It should be kept always in good equipment and training, and it should serve as the last firm line of the Republic's defense. After long hesitation, the government accepted the plan and empowered Machiavelli to realize it in action. In 1508, he led his new Militia to the siege of Pisa, where it acquitted itself well. Pisa surrendered, and Machiavelli returned to Florence at the height of his arc. On a second mission to France in 1510, he passed through Switzerland. His enthusiasm was aroused by the armed independence of the Swiss Confederation, and he made it his ideal for Italy. Returning from France, he saw the problem of his country. How could its separate principalities unite to protect Italy if a united nation like France should decide to absorb the whole peninsula? The supreme test of his militia came too soon. In 1512, Julius II, furious against Florence for having refused to join in expelling the French from Italy, ordered the armies of the Holy League to suppress the Republic and restore the Medici. And Machiavelli's militia, assigned to defend the Florentine line at Prato, broke and fled before the trained mercenaries of the League. Florence was taken, the Medici triumphed. Machiavelli lost both his reputation and his governmental post. He made every effort to appease the victors and might have succeeded. But two ardent youths, conspiring to re-establish the Republic, were detected. Among their papers was found a list of persons on whose support they had counted. It included Machiavelli. He was arrested and tortured with four turns of the rack, but no evidence of his complicity having been found, he was released. Fearing rearrest, he removed his wife and four children to the ancestral villa at San Casciano. There he spent all but the last of his remaining fifteen years, fretting in hopeful poverty. But for this disaster... We should never have heard of him, for it was in those hungry years that he wrote books that moved the world. 2. The Author and the Man It was a dreary isolation for one who had lived at the very core of Florentine politics. Occasionally he would ride into Florence to talk with old friends and explore any chance of re-employment. Several times he wrote to the Medici, but he received no reply. In a celebrated letter to his friend Vittori then Florentine ambassador in Rome, he described his life and told how he came to write The Prince. Since my last misfortunes, I have led a quiet country life. I rise with the sun and go into one of the woods for a few hours to inspect yesterday's work. I pass some time with the woodcutters, who have always some troubles to tell me, either of their own or my neighbors. On leaving the wood, I go to a spring and thence up to my bird-snaring enclosure with a book under my arm. Dante, Petrarch, or one of the minor poets, such as Tabalus or Ovid. I read their amorous transports and the history of their loves, recalling my own to my mind, and time passes pleasantly in these meditations. Then I betake myself to the inn by the roadside, chat with passers-by, ask news of the places whence they come, hear various things, and note the varied tastes and diverse fancies of mankind. This carries me to the dinner hour, when, in the company of my brood, I swallow whatever fare this poor little place of mine and my slender patrimony can afford me. In the afternoon I go back to the inn. There I generally find the host, a butcher, a miller, and a couple of brickmakers. I mix with these boors the whole day, playing at Krika and Triktrak, which games give rise to a thousand quarrels and much exchange of bad language. And we generally wrangle over farthings, and our shouts can be heard in San Casciano town. 
Steeped in this degradation, my wits grow moldy, and I vent my rage at the indignity of fate. At nightfall I return home and seek my writing room, and divesting myself on its threshold of my rustic garments, stained with mud and mire, I assume courtly attire, and thus suitably clothed, I enter within the ancient courts of ancient men, by whom, being cordially welcomed, I am fed with the food that alone is mine, and for which I was born, and am not ashamed to hold discourse with them and inquire the motives of their actions. And these men in their humanity reply to me, and for the space of four hours I feel no weariness, remember no trouble, no longer fear poverty, no longer dread death. My whole being is absorbed in them. And since Dante says that there could be no science without retaining that which is heard, I have recorded that which I have acquired from the conversation of these worthies, and have composed a pamphlet, a Principatibus, in which I plunge as deeply as I can into cogitations upon this subject, discussing the nature of princedom, of how many species it consists, how these are to be acquired, how they are maintained, why they are lost. And if you ever cared for any of my scribbles, this one ought not to displease you, and it should be especially welcome to a new prince, for which reason I dedicate it to his magnificence, Giuliano. December 10th, 1513 Probably Machiavelli has here simplified the story. Apparently he began by writing his Discourses on the First Ten Books of Livy, completing his commentary on only the first three books. He dedicated these Discorsi to Zanobi Buondelmonti and Cosimo Rucelli, saying, I send you the worthiest gift I have to offer, inasmuch as it comprises all that I have learned from long experience and continuous study. He remarks that classic literature and law and medicine have been revived to enlighten modern writing and practice. He proposes likewise to resuscitate classic principles of government and apply them to contemporary politics. He does not derive his political philosophy from history, but selects from history incidents supporting the conclusions to which he has been led by his own experience and thought. He takes his examples almost entirely from Livy, sometimes in his haste basing arguments on legends and occasionally helping himself to morsels from Polybius. As he proceeded with the discourses, he perceived that they would be too long, and too long delayed in their completion, to serve as a practical gift to one of the ruling Medici. This book is continued on Cassette 7, Side 1.